a practice gathering. Um, if I'm honest, I'll tell you that I'm a little bit disappointed that we're, we're gathering online. I, I've shared this in a couple of places with some folks, but I really believe in the value of embodied or incarnational community and being present with you. But uh, in a time like this, when that's not possible, I sure am glad that we have the kind of technology that allows us to gather in the way that we are tonight. Now, this is the very first time that we're doing this. So, um, well, there will be speed bumps. There's just no way around it. Uh, yeah, there, it's, there's a chance that this could be messy. So thank you in advance for your grace. Um, but would you join me before I turn it over to Sam? Would you join me for a moment of prayer? God, we are so grateful that you are with us. In some way, this is a reminder that uh, your presence is not just in a room when we gather. Your presence is with us all the time, wherever we go, even as we gather, separated by many, many miles, but connected over the internet. You are still with us. And so, Lord, as we move into this time tonight, we offer it to you. We ask that you would do with this gathering whatever it is that you would want to do. And Lord, we, we trust you. We know that you are good. And we know, above all, that you love us. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, friends, with that, I will turn it over to Sam to guide us in our opening liturgy. Sam, my friend, you are currently muted. No. All right. Are we in? You are in, my friend. All right. <laughs> Speed bump number one. <laughs> so just a word of advice. Even the host can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. Just for those who are experimenting with Zoom right now. So let's take that from the top. Um, basically, what I said a minute ago was I was just inviting you to pull out your order of service, whether you printed it out or if you want to just pull it up, there's a link. Um, in the Facebook Live, where you can pull out that order of service and join with us as we sing. We're going to sing, Please Speak. Please speak, your servant is listening. Please speak. Your servant is listening. Please speak. Your servant is listening. Your servant is listening. Oh, Hosanna. Sing that again. Sing this together. Please speak. Please speak. 
please be your servant is listening. Please be your servant is listening. Please be your servant is listening. join me in reading Psalm 95 by reading the bold text. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let, let us make, make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let, let us make, make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and, and a, a great, great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Amen. So wherever you are right now, I invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing together about the goodness of our God. We'll sing this out. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, until I lay my head, I will sing. Of the goodness of God, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I have been I will see of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Let's sing this out together. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, through darkest nights. You are close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend, I have been in the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful, all my life. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why do you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people 
and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the plate Massa and Merab because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Let's sing this out together. All who are thirsty. All who are thirsty. All who are weak. Come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow. Be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, we sing the Lord Jesus. Sing it out for the Lord Jesus. Deep cries 
have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now receive the assurance of forgiveness. Beloved children of God, hear and receive the good news. The water of life flows with abundance to fill us with hope, to cleanse us of our guilt, guilt, to heal us toward a new life. Washed in the living water, we are forgiven and set free to live abundant life. Thanks and praise to God. Amen. and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, pass it back over to Jason now. Amen. Thanks, Sam. Well, friends, welcome to the practice for our very first online, uh, very first virtual practice, the practice unplugged, I think we're calling it. Uh, friends, you know that the practice is a community of people who are seeking to follow Jesus more fully in our everyday lives, to live more fully in the presence of Jesus so that we can be formed by Jesus to be like Jesus for the sake of the world. And today is the fourth Sunday of uh, Lent. I know we're following uh, the lectionary for the third Sunday because this was originally prepared for last week, but this season of Lent, we have been experimenting with letting go. A few weeks ago, we gathered and we wrote an experiment for this season. We said, what are some of those things that get in the way of us being able to hear the voice of God, that we are God's beloved children, to connect with that identity, our primary identity, that we are God's beloved children. And so we chose to give up some of the things that get in the way of hearing that voice, the uh, listening to the competing voices, to the voice of God. And so... If you're a part of the local practice community and you're on this journey with an experiment, how is your experiment going? I know I've noticed that I had to kind of remind myself of my experiment this week as everything was disrupted and we've been home almost 24 seven, very rarely stepping outside even because it's been so cold. That disruption has made it hard for me to remember that we've had this experiment going and so I had to recommit myself. I wonder if you're anything like me. Well friends, tonight uh, we get the joy of hearing from Mimi Dixon. Mimi was originally scheduled to come out last weekend and actually she did 
come out last weekend, which was uh, pretty amazing. And just a few of us gathered uh, in a home and allowed Mimi to uh, teach a group of people uh, in person. And so we recorded it. Uh, we don't have Mimi on this call with us, unfortunately, but uh, we do have her teaching and her practice that I will share in just a moment. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing that. But if you don't know Mimi, Mimi is uh, a part of Renovare. She is on the Renovare board. We've uh, we built a bit of a, uh, bit of a uh, relationship uh, with the people from Renovare, which has been wonderful. Uh, she is or was a pastor at a church in Golden, Colorado. She was there for over 30 years uh, and just recently retired. And I will tell you that uh, I have only had a handful of conversations with Mimi, uh, but she has very quickly become one of my favorite people in the whole entire world. So I can't wait for you to get a chance to listen to Mimi. And I promise we will bring her back sometime when she can visit for the whole community. So I would say, please join me in welcoming Mimi Dixon, but I don't think she would hear your applause. So here you go. Oh, what a privilege it is to be with you here today, even for some of you, even if it's remotely. I realize that this is a first for this community, but it's not the first time that people have gathered in homes to worship the Lord together and to be present to what he's doing. Uh, Rob Banks, who was one of my professors in seminary, said that he envisioned a future when this would return when the people of God would gather again in small communities and neighborhoods. Feed on the Lord together, nurture one another in our formation in Christ, and then take that out to our places of work, into our neighborhoods, into the carpools, wherever we are. You enjoy a reputation among the Renovari community for being a people who are after God's heart. So it's really a privilege for me to be with here with you here today. We had an opportunity earlier to share some stories and talk about ways that we're seeing God at work in our lives and in the world today. We're entering into a very interesting time, not something that we're surprised by because we know we've been expecting something would be changing around us, but when it actually arrives, it's an interesting thing to recognize both the cost of it and the sacrifice, but also the rich opportunity. I trust that the Lord will keep each of you and protect you in this time as we navigate this unprecedented time of social quarantine and change. I'm so glad to be invited by Jason to be here with you to talk about Lent, this time of the year when we follow Jesus into an increasing stripping. It's interesting that we, we knew that we were entering into this season, but we're experiencing it now and the invitation at different levels and depths. So as we begin, I would like to offer a prayer of Dallas Willard on our behalf. Lord Jesus Christ, we are thankful that you have said Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are thankful, Jesus, for the ease with which you walked upon this earth, the generosity and kindness you showed to people, the devotion with which you cared for those who were out of the way and in trouble, the extent to which you even loved your enemies and laid down your life for them. We are so thankful to believe that this is a life for us, a life without lack, a life of sufficiency. It is so clear in you, the sufficiency of your Father and the fullness of life that was poured through you, and we're so thankful that you have promised that same love, that same joy, that same power for us. Lord, slip up on us tonight. 
get past our defenses, our worries, our concerns. Gently open our souls and speak your word into them. We believe you want to do it, and we wait for you to do it now. In your name, amen. In the 14th century, Julian of Norwich said, God wishes to be seen, and he wishes to be sought. God wishes to be expected, and he wishes to be trusted. The season of Lent provides a wonderful opportunity for us to respond to God's invitation into a deepening relationship. And one thing we know is that it matters to him that he does not walk alone to the cross. But we choose to journey with him, to accompany him. But first, we must let go. A story illustrates the challenge. Two young boys seeing a tall tree positioned next to a barn could not resist the temptation to climb up onto the roof. So they clambered up the tree and found a sturdy branch to swing over. And for two hours, they played happily on the roof, gazing out over the fields, lying on their back, watching the birds soar and imagining that they too could fly. As the shadows of evening began to lengthen, they went to the tree to climb back down, and at that point, they discovered that the branch which under their weight had bent to the roof was now well beyond their reach. The fun quickly drained away as they came to terms with their predicament. They called out for help, but no one heard. No one came. Sitting in the fading sunlight, the boys hugged their knees against the cooling air and squeezed back tears. Then they heard a sound. Springing to their feet, the boys crept as close to the roof's edge as they dared. Sure enough, they saw a truck driving down the road toward the barn, shouting for help. They could hear the car door open and then the truck door slam shut and a man call out, where are you? We're here, up on the roof. Up on the roof? The man backed up to where he could see the boys. Come over to the edge, he directed them. Now, one at a time, jump, and I will catch you. Without hesitating, the first boy stood, took a deep breath, and jumped. The man easily caught him, lowered him to the ground. Then he encouraged the second boy, your turn now, jump. But the terrified child remained seated. He shook his head a firm no. I wonder what, cur what gives us the courage to let go? What gives us the courage to jump? It took time and much cajoling from his friend before the boy at last summoned the courage to jump. When he was safely on the ground and the two of them were around, going around the back of the truck so that they could get in to be driven home, he whispered to his friend, why, weren't you, why were you not afraid to jump? The second boy, surprised, answered, he's my dad. <laughs> Human beings are born with two primary needs, the need for security and the need for significance. As young children, we are constantly scanning the world around us, drawing conclusions about our safety and about our value, and we carefully record our findings in our memory. In this way, we are like cartographers in the 15th century whose job it was to map the shoreline on parchment as their ships sailed by. We lock into memory the contours of our experience. Every person you meet navigates their life by maps drawn in a child's hand. Every person you meet has crayon maps mounted on the walls of his or her soul. But consider this. On your handout, you see two maps. 
Suppose we were to place a 15th century map alongside a modern satellite photograph of the same coastal region. Which would we choose to navigate our passage? We would trust the photograph over the ancient map. Even so, Jesus invites us to roll up our crayon maps the ways we have learned to secure our safety and ensure our significance to embrace the spiritual discipline of letting go. Jesus puts it this way. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus says, finders weepers, losers keepers. What is it that makes this invitation so hard to accept? What holds us back? Well, the first thing that holds us back is our need for security. Think of the boy on the roof who was afraid to jump. His instinct for security held him back, and that was a good thing until it wasn't, because it prevented his rescue. When we are hurt, we record the details in our minds. Afraid of being injured in the same way, we scribble a notation on our maps. There be danger here. Avoid at all costs. We build walls to shield and protect us from hurt. Walls that then must be carefully dismantled if we ever are to experience the freedom that we were created to know. When our need for security becomes overbalanced, fear becomes our primary motivator. We become avoidant, limiting our options smothering our freedom. A young man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to ensure eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus asked. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The young man inquired. Jesus replied, these are all from the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, Go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. A similar story finds its way to us from the Desert Fathers. A young monk came to Abba Joseph and said to him, Abba, as far as I am able, I keep the daily, fat, daily office, I fast, I pray and meditate. I live in peace with my brothers. I purify my thoughts. What else can I do? The old man stood and stretched his hands toward heaven. His fingers became like ten lamps of fire. And he declared, why not become all fire? Why not become all fire? Well, we know how the young man whom Jesus similarly addressed responded to this same invitation. When he heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? 
Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It was his need for security that held the young man back from the life he longed to live. He simply was not free to follow Jesus into uncharted territory. It takes a lot of courage to let go. It takes courage and a whole lot of trust that God really does know for us to have the courage to jump, to let go. I like to think that the rich young man thought it over. That he walked away from this conversation and he thought it over. And I like to think that he changed his mind. I like to think that he eventually tracked Jesus down and came to him and said, I'm all in. Can I really follow you? Can I really be your disciple? And that Jesus said, I knew you'd come back. Welcome. I like to think. I'd like to hope that he rerouted his security in Jesus. A second hindrance challenges our ability to let go. It's our inborn need for significance. Significance is the quality of being worthy, valuable, important. It most often is tied to the way that we are perceived by other people. St. Teresa of Calcutta said the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved, invisible, unseen, weightless. One of the scriptures in today's lectionary selection tells the story of a Samaritan woman whom Jesus engaged in conversation it was her need that drew Jesus to her. He witness, witnessing her shame, her efforts to avoid censure, her longing for love, his heart was filled with compassion. And when Jesus told her how she could satisfy her deepest thirst, she not only leapt at the opportunity, but she ran into town to share this good news with the very people who had shunned her. The entire town of Sychar came to faith in Jesus because of the change they saw in her. This was not the same woman. The result of her witness was undeniably significant. Significance at this scale is the outcome we all seek. We want our witness for the kingdom of God to count but I wonder, how is significance determined in the kingdom of God? Is it possible to be kingdom significant without measurable outcomes? What do you think? Let's consider Isaiah as a case in point. In 740 BC, King Uzziah died. 52 years of faithful leadership as Judah's longest reigning king came to an end. Isaiah was shaken. From his point of view, the throne was now empty. With Assyria threatening Israel's no northern border, the situation was dire. So what does he do? He goes to the temple where he prostrates himself before God. And he receives a vision. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lofty. And his throne, his, his, the train of his robe, filled the entire temple. Isaiah sees that the throne is not empty. It is occupied. But the shock of finding himself in God's holy, majestic presence is more than Isaiah can take. Dismayed, he cries out, Woe is me! I am lost! For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then from the throne, God 
tells a seraph to respond. So the angel goes over to the altar. He removes a coal. I mean, think about this. And he touches Isaiah's mouth with it and declares, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then in that amazing moment, suspended, he hears God from the throne say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Instinctively he cries out, Here am I, send me. Eugene Peterson observes that as Isaiah is then pulled into the holy life and service of God, he is solemnly informed that nothing much is going to come of his work. He is told he's going to be a preacher, but a conspicuously unsuccessful preacher. He's going to speak with incredible power and eloquence, and people are going to go to sleep in the middle of his sermons. He will have, have access to all the kings in his lifetime, to Ahaz, Jotham, Hezekiah. He will be an insider to the operations of state at its highest levels and have his wise and godly counsel ignored. The end result of a lifetime of God-ordained and God-infused preaching will be that the Assyrians will march into the land and ravage the place. Judah will look like a forest that's been clear-cut by aggressive, greedy loggers, ugly, defaced, barren, all the trees chopped down and hauled away, leaving nothing but stumps. An entire country of stumps. This is what Isaiah is told on the day he volunteers to serve. The end result of your immersion in holiness, your honest confession, your cleansed speech, your vocation and holy orders, the end result will be stumps. An entire nation of stumps. This is not the future that Isaiah imagined when he answered God's call. This was not his definition of significance. Isaiah had reasonably assumed if God is in it, the work is virtually guaranteed. My delivery of God's message will release a tsunami of willing response. But this is not what Isaiah is told to expect. Instead, Isaiah is given a vision of acres and acres of stumps. Gazing in horror upon the devastation, Isaiah's eye comes to rest upon a single squat stump. And God's final word to him and it is an enigmatic glimpse into the far distant future. The holy seed is its stump. Apparently there's more to this unremarkable stump than anyone supposes. Five chapters later in chapter 11, Isaiah is given an elaboration. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The sp Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We know now how that promise came to be fulfilled. His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. But even as we gratefully sing the praises of our victorious Lord, we never lose touch with that stump. For very often, stumps will characterize and dominate our lives, not for all of us, to be sure, but for many of us. Having made the decision to follow Jesus, we will look around and wonder, how did it ever come to this? Where is God in this? 
we will evaluate the effectiveness of effectiveness of our own witness and evaluate it to be inadequate. Confused, we will be tempted by discouragement. It's not hard to imagine how Isaiah must have felt when God revealed to him what was sure to come. So much disappointment, so much loss, so much heartache. But then again, there was that tiny shoot pushing up from the root of an ordinary looking stump. Can such a tiny thing make a difference? God gives his desolate prophet a promise. The day will surely come, Isaiah, when the field of stumps where you stand will be a lush forest, spreading to fill the whole earth as far as the eye can see and beyond with life and beauty and goodness. It will not happen right away, Isaiah, not in your lifetime. But the fulfillment has already begun. As a child in church, I remember singing a hymn. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. God is working his purpose out and the time is drawing near. Nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that will surely be when the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. God gave his prophet a glimpse of what would surely be. While his current efforts appeared to be as nothing, God was working his purpose out and Isaiah was part of it. This gives a whole new meaning, doesn't it, to kingdom significance? God's ways are not our ways. God's timing is not our timing. God's story is unfolding and we typically cannot see our little part in it and how it fits into this wonderful drama that is unfolding. It would be another eight centuries before the inspired words Isaiah proclaimed became visible in the birth of Jesus Christ. Eight centuries! And we worry about a couple years. It turns out that letting go is not a one-time decision. The choice to trust God must be made every single time things do not seem to be working out as we fully anticipated that they would. Reflecting on the declaration of 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. F.B. Myers cautions, we often make a great mistake thinking that God is not guiding us at all because we cannot see far out in front. But this is not his method. God only undertakes that the steps of a good person should be ordered by the Lord, not next year, but tomorrow. Not the next mile, but the next yard. Not the whole pattern, but the next stitch in the canvas. If you expect more than this, F.E. Meyer says, you will be disappointed and withdraw into the darkness. Letting go requires courage to know that God can be trusted, both for our security and for our significance. Another today's lectionary, Selections, underscores this truth. It describes the challenges that the newly liberated slaves of Egypt experienced as God brought them into the wilderness and gave them a whole new identity as holy priests of God. It describes the challenges they experienced in the wilderness of Sinai. Now I have to give you a confession. Whenever I read the story of the Israelites out in the wilderness, I thought, what a bunch of complaining wimps Mm -hmm. until I saw it. And any of you who have actually seen the Sinai, this is serious desert. There's nothing growing there. 
no plants, nothing. The Sinai is a desolate, waterless expanse baking in the unrelenting sun at summer temperatures averaging 115 degrees. Ugh. Had it not been for the cloud cover that God provided, they would not have lasted a single day. So Moses and the people, they practice this discipline. Stay in the shadow. Don't move beyond the boundaries of the shadow. And that's how God guided them through the wilderness. Numbers 9 tells us that whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set up. And they left. Whenever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the orders of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out, but when it lifted, they would set out. So think about what Jesus is saying when he says, follow me. Stay in my shadow. Stay close. Do what you see me doing. Jean-Pierre de Cassade writes, we learn from Jesus to be light as a feather, liquid as water, simple as a child, active as a ball in receiving and following all the inspirations of God's grace. We allow God to act and abandon ourselves entirely to him. As we seek only the kingdom of God by love and obedience, all the rest will be added. This is how we jump into our Father's open waiting arms. With God, everything is possible. Now, when we hear from God, we need a way to respond. And that is one of the great things about the practice. Each Sunday, you embrace this rhythm of listening and responding. So tonight, we're going to be engaging in a practice that Richard Foster introduced in his book, Celebration of Discipline. It is a discipline that is designed to help us let go. It is a movement that follows a three, four parts where we utilize our bodies to align our spirits with God's Holy Spirit. <laughs> so we're going to begin our practice with putting both of your feet flat on the floor. And we're going to move your shoulders a little bit and relax. And then with your eyes closed, draw in a few deep breaths. place your palms face down on your lap as a symbol of your desire to release any concerns you have to God with your palms facing down picture what it is that keeps you from jumping what holds you back inwardly you might pray something like God I release to you my fear about that unresolved situation I surrender my anxiety over finances. I surrender my fear about the coronavirus. I give you my frustration over how things are going. I confess that persistent habit that I cannot seem to overcome. Whatever it is that weighs on your mind, palms down, tell Jesus and let it go. After a period of silence, we'll move to the next part of the prayer exercise.
as an indication now of your desire to receive from the Lord. Turn your palms up. You might pray something like, Lord, I choose to trust you with the concerns I have named. I look to you to provide for my security and significance. I trust you to lead me into your plan for my life. I trust you with outcomes. I receive now your assurance, your peace, your patience, your joy. During this time, if impressions or directions come, fine. If not, fine. Palms up. Receive what God longs to give. may re be repeated any time you feel the pull of temptation, the angst of discouragement, the chill of fear. It helps us to focus our attention on the open, open waiting arms of God. movement of the prayer exercise we rest in what we have received we don't ask for anything we simply rest in the loving embrace of God Thomas Kelly describes a heaven-directed life as being a life of unhurried peace and power. It is simple. It is serene. It is amazing. It is triumphant. It is radiant. It takes no time, but it occupies all our time makes our life programs new and overcoming. We need not get frantic. He is at the helm. And when our little day is done, we lie down quietly in peace, for all is well. The fourth and final movement is to respond. What do you want to say to God? 
I often compose words of my own to say in response to what I've received, but I also find it meaningful to pray the words of others. Let's take just some t silent time for you to respond to God. What do you want Him to hear from you? began with a prayer written by Dallas Willard. I will close with a prayer written by St. Ignatius. It's printed on your handout if you wish. You may pray with me. Take, Lord, receive Save all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my understanding, my whole will, all that I have, all that I possess. You give it all to me, Lord. I give it all back to you. Do with it as you will, according to your great pleasure. You give me your love and your grace, for this is enough for me. Well, friends, if you would turn with me now from that practice to your order of practice to the communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Holy, 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 Lord God. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at the table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. again. Now gathered at our tables, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Now, friends, if you have your communion elements with you, I invite you to receive communion now. If you are with family or others in your home, then I would encourage you to still serve one another so that you may receive communion. If you don't have the elements, you will see printed in your order of practice a prayer of spiritual communion. And what I would encourage you to do without the elements is perhaps to place your hands over your hearts and simply bow your head and to read this prayer, this spiritual communion. So take this time now to receive communion. you're done receiving communion why don't you stand with me we're going to sing a final hymn together take my life and let it be even in this strange season it's our prayer that god would use us that god would use us to be christ's hands and christ's feet christ's mouth um, even in this strange time so let this be our prayer as we prepare to be sent out for this time Let's sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my home and accept Thy will. Let them flow in ceaseless breeze. Take my hands and let them that be false of thy love. Take my feet and let them be spirit and
Friends, what a gift it was to worship with you. It was a little bit awkward at times, I think, but to know that we're gathered together, even now at the same time in our own separate houses, it's a gift to know that our community still stands. So I'm glad that you are with us tonight. Well, friends, as you know, uh, the practice, we like to say that Sunday is not the main event, that our actual lives are the main event. And so as I said before, in this season of Lent, many of us uh, have written an experiment, an experiment of letting go, of uh, letting go of the things that get in the way of hearing God's voice, that we are the Lord's beloved children, the ways that we listen to the competing voices, to let go of those things and to intentionally listen to the voice of God, to take up a practice that helps us to intentionally hear God's voice telling us that we are the beloved children of God. And so I wonder, as you consider Mimi's teaching about the draw of safety and significance, how does this impact your experiment? I personally found as I listened, I was comforted as Mimi spoke about the difficulty of following Jesus into uncharted territory. This week has certainly felt like uncharted territory, like deep waters. There's a grace in what Mimi taught that was very helpful for me. And I also found myself thinking a great deal about how uh, central this, the desire and the search for significance is in my letting go. And so I have a lot to think about. And how about you? How does this time of teaching and practice impact your experiment? It may be that you uh, want to carry that practice with you, that embodied practice, palms down in surrender, palms up to receive, listening and responding to what the Lord has to say. Perhaps that works into your experiment. Or if you're joining us tonight and you have not crafted an experiment for the season of Lent, perhaps this practice may be one that you hold on to this week. It feels like there is a lot to surrender and let go of in the midst of a very disruptive time that this is. So how might you intentionally quiet yourself with this practice? So friends, next week uh, we will do this again. Uh, but next week our hope is to have an actual video of Kelly Fabian teaching us. I apologize if that was unclear that we thought we were getting an actual video uh, from Mimi. But next week, we will have a video uh, with Kelly. Kelly is a good friend of the practice, was on the practice team uh, at the very beginning. And many of you know her and love her as much as we do. And so we can't wait to hear from Kelly as we uh, continue on this journey with Lent. And then uh, the following week is Palm Sunday. 
Uh, and it's uh, honestly, I feel really, I feel really sad that uh, we will not be able to gather in person for Palm Sunday. Again, if you're a part of our local community, you know this is a time when we uh, have a potluck of glory after the gathering. It's a family service, and then we gather together. And so unfortunately, we won't have that this year, but we will still be gathering together here online, and we will be engaging the story of Palm Sunday as we uh, finish our journey through this season of Lent. And friends, uh, just a couple more announcements, things to encourage you with before we close with the benediction tonight. Um, first of all, this is a season where we feel very, I personally feel very disconnected uh, in the house, uh, with the family, but not connected to very many people outside. This week, uh, I have very intentionally uh, reached out to a handful of people just to connect, to check in, to see how people are doing. I shared on the email that uh, in, in my prayer time earlier this week, I sensed a renewed uh, invitation from God to pray very specifically an invitation uh, intentionally for the individuals in our community. And so I wonder how in this season you might be very intentional about not uh, being completely disconnected. I know for some of us, that's hard. Uh, for some of us, loneliness is a great struggle. And I know for myself, when I'm lonely, I tend to not want to reach out to people. I tend to wait and hope that someone will reach out to me. If that's, uh, if that's you, would you consider taking a step this week and reaching out to someone? If that's not you, would you still consider this week taking a step? and reaching out to someone in our community or outside of our community, but reaching out to make some meaningful connections, a check-in, to see how people are doing in the midst of this time. And then the second thing that I wanted to share with you is something that we are going to start uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, Sam came to the team earlier this week and said, I wonder if there's some sort of practice we can engage in this time. I had another conversation with someone in our community who was talking about how there's, there's a pain in this time of separation and disruption. And uh, she incredibly uh, brilliantly and wisely pointed out that while we tend to want to dismiss the pain to push it aside, even the loneliness, the pain of loneliness, that uh, we might look at how we can lean into God in that time. I think it's often that times of disruption are some of the most fertile opportunities for us to open ourselves to the formational work of God in our lives. And so, uh, to help towards that end, uh, we are going to begin something uh, tomorrow, uh, and it's a daily practice. It's something that we will release both on the podcast every day, and it will also be on the website. Uh, we are going to engage the spiritual practice of the daily offer. The daily office is a rhythm of prayer where we pause in the morning, at midday, and in the evening for prayer. And so we'll have a guided prayer for you to use to walk you through in the morning, in the midday, and the evening. All together, these prayers are less than 20 minutes, about 10 minutes in the morning, and about five minutes at midday, and about five minutes in the evening. And so I would encourage you to engage in this rhythm of prayer with us. It's yet another way that we as a community can be united in our practice, even though we are separated by a distance. So I hope that you will find these resources helpful, uh, and we look forward to continuing to engage with one another uh, as best we can online, uh, and then looking forward to the day when we can return together in person once again. And so, would you please join me in this benediction? You may rise if you are able, but would you hold your hands out and receive this benediction? This is the benediction, by the way, that Mimi offered to us last week. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.